Some of the digital stuff that's in there was done working with a professor at Syracuse and Keith Hanlon, and we actually worked real hard to uh, introduce kind of grain and a little bit of flicker and a little bit of dust using you know those tricks you can use now in software to, to the so that the the, uh, the digital image was so pristine that it didn't cut well with the rest of the footage. You had to kind of make it look more you know more film-like and grainy, a little bit like a bad transfer, just slightly. Kind of helped a lot, helped it read better. Um, anyway. This came out, this uh, piece of music was um, uh, on a, uh, a record of ours that's called Escape from Noise. Woo! And... <laughs> Thanks. Embarrassing. Um, anyway, uh, we had put out our first few records all on our own, total do it yourselfers and all that, and then we finally had ended up signing with a, a, a kind of a medium sized kind of punk rock record label called SST Records in LA. <laughs> You might not clap later on. Um, who's put out groups like Sonic Youth and Who's Purdue and the Minutemen and Meat Puppets? And it was founded by one of the, the, the label was started by the uh, found, founding member of the band Black Flag, a guy named Greg Kim. Anyway, they released this thing and it was really doing extraordinarily well to our shock and surprise. It was a hit on college radio. I mean, who would think? You know, if you've heard the record, it's, it's a very, for the, for the era it came out, and it was very strange. But it definitely, it seemed like to be an accessible kind of, you know, it was weird and strange and quirky, but accessibly so. So it was getting programmed in the middle of the day on mainstream college radio stations uh, around the U.S., just, you know, in between, you know, R.E.M. songs and stuff, whatever was popular back then. Anyway, um, I don't know how much college radio really even occupies the cultural kind of life and landscape of students in college anymore, because the web is... WCBS! <laughs> like that or WFMU, it's real true free form. Yeah. You, you never know what's you never know what's gonna come next. And that to me is the real fun and educational part of it. And it's like a you know an, an audio roller coaster ride. That's radio I kinda yeah, it's my favorite. So your station here is great. <laughs> anyway, it's a big hit. So um, Negative Land at that point had been playing live occasionally in the Bay Area, California Bay Area, and uh, we thought, well, geez, maybe if we're doing well enough, maybe we could actually do a tour. And we weren't expecting to make money, but we thought, well, we, maybe we could break even, you know, because we would have to quit our jobs or take time off from our work or something, you know, and, and uh, we thought well, we could at least break even. So we started organizing a tour. Now, um, it very quickly became apparent after we announced the tour and got all the, started getting the dates lined up that the whole thing was going to lose colossal amounts of money. Because even though we were popular on college radio, we had kind of forgotten about the fact that, well, the clubs don't even know who you are. They're not going to pay you crap, you know. It's just not going to work. So we were realizing, we, we finally came to the conclusion that we actually were going to have to cancel the tour. Well, as you can imagine, from working with media more and more often, we were becoming increasingly interested in how the media worked. What are we trying to say by taking this work? And if you follow kind of the trajectory of our creative work, you'll sort of see how it gradually becomes more and more political. Not really with any intention, but just because, you know, we got older and kept doing this stuff and just become more thoughtful and more aware of what we're doing and asking ourselves, well, why are we doing this? Why are we still making this kind of work? What are we trying to say with it? Um, well, so now we have to cancel the tour. Hmm, how do we do that? Well, Richard had uh, was working his all-night security guard job, uh, and he... Um, that's right, this is not a good way to make a living, folks. I've actually been paid more money to talk about the work I do than I've ever been paid from doing it. So for those of you in art school, that's... You're doomed. Just get sued and you can make money off of it. Um, so anyway, he was reading uh, this newspaper article in the New York Times. It was about a teenager in Rochester, Minnesota, and it, uh, who had uh, taken an axe in the middle of the night. He had chopped up his mother, father, brother, and sister. He killed them. And they were a devoutly religious family. There was some discussion of it being an argument over music or something to do with music or something. And Richard, who has a very dark sense of humor, and he's the only person in Native Land who would ever even think of this. <laughs> he's bored, of course, and he starts writing for immediate release. And you write that at the top of a press release, right? To go to the media. For immediate release. Federal authorities have asked Negative Land to cancel their long-planned 17-city tour pending an investigation of a possible connection between the quadruple axe murders in Rochester, Minnesota, and their song, Christianity is Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you laugh. But we did too. And we thought this was kind of sick and kind of fucked up, but it was funny. And, and uh, funny is always good, right? So we also thought that this was much more interesting than the truth. And we thought, well, gosh, we've been so interested in how the media works by how we chew it up and spit it back out. What if we insert something directly into the media, you know, meat grinder ourselves? What will happen? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> We're now on a label that's got a gigantic press mailing list, you know, it can kind of get everywhere. And so we sent this thing out as the reason, the explanation of why the tour is being canceled. Well, Nothing much happened, but about a month later there was some zine, if any of you remember what zines are. Oh, yeah. um, they've been replaced by blogs, I think. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> that is good. Right. It's like the entire world, if everyone is just spending time writing about their own opinions, who's actually reading this stuff? You know, I don't understand that part. Um, anyway, uh, some zine wrote about it and actually re re uh, regurgitated the press release, kind of verbatim actually, which was kind of interesting to see. And I realized, yeah, when you write press releases, you try to make it as, realize that journalists are either overworked and or lazy, and that you need to make them as, as pre-written as possible. Make it already sound like an article, and they'll use them, they're more likely that they'll yeah. use more of it. <laughs> so anyway, then a regional um, art and music magazine that covered most of California uh, got a hold of the story. I don't know if you have anything, do you have, there must be some Ann Arbor kind of progressive weekly, is there? Or out of Detroit? Yeah. So it was something like that, and they ended up writing a full-page story about it. We talked to them and said, look, how could this be true? How could music cause murders to happen? The whole thing must be like a hoax. It's ridiculous. And um, we were thinking about really pulling back from talking to the media at all, just letting this experiment play itself out and not, not participating in any way. But we changed our minds about that when one day I was working at my job as an assistant nursery school teacher. And, uh, <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> Why is that funny? Anticipation. No, I was actually, it's actually a job I was good at. And actually, if you know our older work, the reason why there's a lot of kids recording, it's like this little girl singing over the rainbow with the hiccups, is because they would take my tape recorder to, to, to work with me. <laughs> it's a very cute recording. Um, so anyway, someone comes up and knocks on the door, you know, uh, Mark, can you come to the... Uh, we are, um, there's a call for you in the office from uh, this guy from CBS, Channel 5 News. Uh, I don't know what this is about. What Do you know? Uh, oh, no, 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 I have no idea. And I thought, my God, how have they tracked me down to my place of employment? I don't know. So I went down to the office. Luckily, no one was there. And I picked up the phone. And sure enough, it was reporter Hal Eisner from KPIX Eyewitness News which was the CBS News affiliate for San Francisco. Hal had seen the article in this uh, Bay Area music, you know, the, the, the uh, it was called BAM, the, this, again, this regional kind of culture and arts magazine. He'd seen that article, and they wanted to talk to us about it. And I just was sort of taken aback that it had gotten this far, you know, and wondered, how do I play this guy? How do I respond? What's the right thing to do? I don't know. So what I did do was I, I said, I said, oh, Mr. Eisner, no, we, uh, no, no, we don't want to talk to you. I mean, people are, it's, this is very bad, and people are accusing us of trying to just get publicity out of this. <laughs> uh, it's made our lives just a living hell. And, and, and he's like, oh, no, 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 it's okay. I mean, we really want to tell your side of the story, you know. And I said, well, you're just going to, you're just going to sensationalize it. And then, no, 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 we're not. You know, he was on our side. And so I, I, I kind of, kind of, in the spur of the moment, really didn't pick the best way to respond because it sucked him in totally. Because here I am telling him I don't want to talk to him. Right? And so how I, I reluctantly let him convince me that he could interview Negative Land about the whole story, and that it was all going to be telling, you know, it was going to be a very even-handed news story and tell our point of view. So hung up the phone with Hal and agreed to show up in a few hours, and then I called up the rest of Negative Land and I said, my God, we all have to meet in two hours at our rehearsal studio and figure out what the hell we're going to do because the Channel 5 newsman is going to show up. So we got there, and um, we kind of figured, well, they're going to want footage, right, or something. They're going to want, and they think we're a band. Now, I don't think Negative Land's a band at all. I think we pretend to be one because it's a more interesting way to kind of get our weird art and political ideas out there into the world. And I like the idea of getting this out in a kind of a pop culture context. I just think that's more interesting. There's, there's more dynamic energy about it in some way than just relegating yourself to just being in the experimental, uh, kind of more academic music bin in the back of 
at a record store. And we do get put there sometimes, but more often than not, we'll actually be kind of, you know, in with the indie rock records, which I really like. And uh, so we set up to kind of fake that we were playing in the studio, pretend to be a band. They came in and like, got footage of that. I knew they would want to make it seem to be kind of weird, so I was playing a bass guitar and I picked up a drumstick and they were filming me and I started playing the bass guitar with the drumstick. You know, thinking, oh, they'll like that. I'm strange. <laughs> And we did talk to them about, again, about how we think the media doesn't check their facts, the news is relying on other news for its sources, it's not actually, uh, you know, really being very responsible, it sensationalizes things. Um, and Don was playing a loop in the background at one point of, uh, it was Lenny Bruce, a tape loop of him saying, it's all a joke, a monstrous joke! And uh, kind of, we were hoping maybe that might make it into the podcast or something. 